If you were locked in a cold, dark dungeon, how many days do you think you would survive? Well, what if your mouth was also clamped shut the entire time? That would make it a bit harder, wouldn't it? Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 brutal punishments from American history that will give you chills. Number 10, ball and chain. We've all heard the phrase, the old ball and chain, but how long ago was a ball and chain actually used as a punishment? Turns out, not that long. The ball and chain was used at Folsom Prison in California in the 19th century. Now, Folsom State Prison is California's second oldest prison, long known for its harsh conditions in the decades following the California gold rush. Now, now these balls and or chains were a perfect example. It was cheap, it was efficient, and it was a pretty brutal punishment. You're not going anywhere. The old ball and chain was also used in Angola prison in Louisiana until fairly recent. Now when you think about the fact that the Mississippi River is on three sides of that prison, a ball and chain feels like it would work nine times out of ten. Unless you have the calves of Michael Phelps, you aren't swimming anywhere with one of these wrapped around your ankle. Number nine, stranded outside. It turns out Judge Michael Sicanetti has given out more than one unusual sentence. Why this judge gives out wacky sentences is beyond me, but here we are. In November 2005, Michelle Murray allegedly abandoned 35 kittens in two Ohio parks. Yeah, not one, not two, 35 kittens. That's horrible. Now, without going into detail, these kittens obviously didn't thrive after this point of abandonment. So the judge simply asked Michelle, how would you like to be dumped off at a metro park late at night, spend the night listening to coyotes and raccoons crawling around you in the dark, and sit out there in the cold not knowing where you're going to get your next meal and not knowing when you're going to be rescued? Yeah, pretty heavy question for a judge to ask you, pretty loaded. So Judge Sicanetti brought the smoke. He told her that she has the choice of jail time, donating to the Humane Society, or spending one night alone in the woods. She chose the latter. She spent the night in the woods like she was camping. That sounds pretty terrible terrifying, but also sounds like she got off far too easy for what she did. She let 35 kittens go in the wild and she got to go camping? Okay, that's a bit not fair. Number eight, solitary confinement. You're grounded for a while. Get down there. You're not coming back out. Solitary confinement is the act of isolating prisoners in a small cell with minimal human contact. It was used to reform and punish, only most of the time the prisoner went insane. Yeah, sorry about that. We forgot about you. Mm. Solitary confinement was introduced in the United States in the 1700s among religious groups. See, at first, they thought that isolation with a Bible in your hands, well, they thought that would lead to rehabilitation. It didn't. They just went mad with said Bible. The practice expanded significantly in the 19th century when it was viewed as a humane alternative to prevailing methods of punishment like public floggings. However, by the early 1900s, it had lost its charm due to its high cost and the fact that it was highly unethical. It would return as a common form of incarceration during the tough on crime political period in the 1980s and 90s, but otherwise you're not going to see this anymore. Thank the lords. I thought being grounded was bad as a kid. This sounds brutal. Number seven, the drunkard's cloak. The drunkard's cloak was a form of punishment used in colonial America for public drunkenness, as you would have guessed. Offenders were made to wear a barrel with holes cut out for their head, I almost said heads and arms, they're not, they don't have two heads, with a barrel with holes cut out for their head and arms, making them a spectacle of public humiliation. Now this punishment aimed to shame the individual and deter others from similar drunken behavior out and about. The last recorded use of the drunkard's cloak in America was in the early 19th century. Thank, thank God. This one's gone. That'd be pretty funny though. You walk down the street, someone wobbling, you're like, okay, he got a little crazy last night. Maybe a bachelor party, who knows? There's five of them, they're all guilty. Six. Tarring and feathering. Tarring and feathering was a form of public punishment and of course, the feathers, you're quite humiliated when this happens. The offender was stripped, covered in hot tar, and then rolled in feathers. They look like a chicken, I guess. I don't know what the whole point was for this. The punishment often targeted tax collectors and other unpopular figures during periods of unrest. Tax collectors, they're like, yeah, go bathe in the tar. We're gonna, this is crazy. Who did this? The first recorded use in America was 1766 against British customers customs officer John Malcolm in Boston. He was the first. God, that would suck to be the first to get tarred and feathered. Oh my God. Imagine hearing that and be like, what? You're making this up. It continued sporadically through the 19th century with one of the last known instances occurring during the early 1900s. It didn't last long. The practice eventually fell out of use as legal systems evolved and more humane methods uh, were adopted. In other words, we said, you know what? That's a bit much, isn't it? That's probably a bit much. We should just do something else. Number five, the electric chair. This next one here is quite shocking. <clears throat> 
The electric chair was introduced in the late 19th century as a little bit more humane alternative to hanging. It was first used in America on August 6, 1890 to punish William Kemmler in New York. Now, the method aimed to provide a quicker and less painful death. However, it has faced criticisms for its potential for causing severe pain and not being that quick. The last use of the electric chair in the US occurred on January 16th, 2013, quite recent. This was after Robert Gleason Jr. was killed in Virginia via electric chair. It's horrible. I used to see it at movies growing up and I thought it was like a fake thing that maybe was in like, you know, Saw movies, but nope, this is how people would die. Just horrible. Number four. Branding. Branding involved marking a criminal skin with a hot iron to permanently indicate their crime, often on the hand or forehead. Big differences, like here or your forehead? Are you kidding me? Can you do anywhere else but my forehead? This form of punishment dates back to ancient times and was used, of course, as a deterrent and a means of public shaming, as are all of these. In America, branding was first used in the early colonial period, using the method for crimes like theft and blasphemy. One of the last recorded instances of branding in the United States was in the early 19th century and societal views on the punishment eventually thankfully evolved and such methods were replaced by incarceration and other normal, if you want to say that, normal forms of reform. Imagine being the last guy being branded. What? That's so, you're so close. Psst. And we're done. No more. Sorry. So close. Number three, exile and banishment. The punishment of go away, just keep going forever, bye. This one involved forcing offenders to leave a community or a region entirely. Just get on out of here. These were common punitive measures in early colonial America, quite a popular place to start these punishments. These punishments were used to remove undesirable individuals such as criminals or those accused of witchcraft from society. Yeah, you're either a thief or a magician. See you later. We don't take either of those. The practice this was rooted in English common law and aimed to protect the community while punishing the offender in a, you know, a more chill way. One of the last notable instances of exile in America was the banishment of Mary Dyer from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1659 for her Quaker beliefs. Now, as the legal system evolved, exile and banishment were largely replaced by imprisonment and fines, but I don't know. I'd rather just be sent off away. That sounds way easier. You know what? Go start fresh. Just don't do it again over there. Bye. What? All right, easy. Number two, pamphlet punishment. This one is very recent and it's so bizarre I had to include it in today's list. In May 2011, an Ohio couple, Grace Nash and Bruce Crawford, they both ignored flood emergency warnings and stole an unregistered raft. They then made their way to the Grand River for a hazardous swim. This was reported by CBS News, and if the headlines weren't bizarre enough here, wait until you hear their punishment. When they made it to land, they allegedly misled officials about the details of this misadventure, but eventually the couple came clean and they admitted to the whole thing and they got a 90-day sentence in jail. Now here's the kicker. 30 days Days were knocked off immediately, and Ohio Judge Michael C. Canetti gave them an option to knock off the rest of their time by standing in a children's pool wearing life jackets and handing out water safety pamphlets during a food festival. They would stand in a pool and hand out pamphlets all day. That sounds like a great time. I don't know. Sounds like they got off easy. A food festival in May? That sounds like the best place to hang out all day. Don't ignore flood warnings or you'll be embarrassed for like eight hours. Okay. Number one, the iron gag. Not to be confused with the iron giant, the iron gag was a metal device used to silence prisoners by clamping their tongues down. Yeah, kind of hard to beg for your life when you can't talk. You have a big piece of metal in your mouth. You have the iron giant's finger down your throat. This horrible device was famously used in the Mateus McComsey case from Lancaster County in 1833. See, Mateus got himself busted for manslaughter and was given the iron gag while serving time in the Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. This case is well known because Mateus died in prison while wearing one of these. Yeah, imagine that. Your last moments and your tongue is clamped down. That's like a saw trap. That's one of the worst ways to go. History is brutal. Number 10, Ted Kaczynski. As a young man, Kaczynski was a mathematic prodigy and at Harvard University, he underwent psychological experimentation designed to harm and humiliate subjects, which may have been part of the CIA's mind control program, aka MKUltra, as he began to have a promising career at UC Berkeley 
quickly, then suddenly resigned and retreated to the wilderness, determined to fight industrialization and the destruction of nature. Between 1978 and 1995, he mailed and delivered explosives to targets of tertiary institutions and aviation companies across the country, killing at least three people and injuring 23. The FBI dubbed him the University and Airline Bomber, leading to the nickname the Unabomber. A manhunt finally caught Kaczynski in 1996, after which he was given eight life sentences. Number nine, Henry Kissinger. Considering he was a very notable figure in American politics, his choices in regards to political American policies involving foreign affairs were extremely costly and disregarding of human life. When the Vietnam War exploded in 1955 and lasted till 1975, it had been noted that it was America's longest and most expensive war that had occurred in that era. At this time, there had been at least four noted US presidents, and Henry Kissinger acted as a Secretary of State for both Nixon and Ford. In regards to the conflicts between the North and the South Vietnam over the control of which mega empire would rule, this side more in Asia, whether the USSR in the North, Americans in the South, that backing that could have technically liberated the South Vietnamese was costly as it was noted to be up to another potential $700 million. But Kissinger, despite him stating in reports he wished Congress approved his call to liberate the South Vietnamese, he happened to also make deals behind closed doors with their leaders, sacrificing them for the US POWs held hostage in the North. But also considering it was expensive and they needed oil, the Middle East were having conflicts after the Nakba that occurred in Palestine, how the colony Israel had taken over lands and in order for the US to get oil, Kissinger had to write to Israel to release some of the land so they could, that they colonized back to the Arab nations so that the US could get oil to continue their war in Vietnam. But the sympathy towards the South Vietnamese dwindled not just economically but socially. When people went into the streets yelling for the government to stop funding this war, killing civilians not just the American young men forced into the war and developing PTSD later, but the hundreds of thousands of innocent Vietnamese that had also died. Kissinger had the gall to also say to President Ford in a quote, if you do that, the American people will go in the streets again and referring to the Vietnamese, why don't those people die faster? The worst thing they can do is linger on. Yeah, he said that. As a result, the $700 million that could have liberated the South Vietnamese mysteriously was rejected by 76 congressmen into the Senate and went towards the colony Israel instead. As well as in regards to the Bangladesh Liberation War, Kissinger sneered at the people who bled for the dying Bengalis and even called Indians bastards. Hmm, nice guy. Number 8, Harvey Weinstein. For sure this guy is pretty new for the history books, but he will for sure be mentioned in law books in regarding to blackmailing, coercion, and so much more messed up stuff like physically harming and harassing women and threatening their career. As a former Hollywood film producer, he became the center of a high profile criminal case that brought attention to issues of harassment and physical harm in the entertainment industry. The allegations against Weinstein were a catalyst for the Me Too movement, a social media campaign encouraging survivors of harassment and harm to come forward with their experiences. The movement shed light on the widespread issues of misconduct and various industries, Weinstein faced a high profile trial in New York in early 2020, and the trial included testimony from multiple women who accused him of misconduct. On February 24, 2020, Weinstein was then convicted of physical non-consensual harm in the third degree and criminal act in the first degree. He was then acquitted for more serious charges, including predatory harm. Number 7, Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Gowl, was an American killer and body snatcher who gained infamy for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s. His activities served as a partial inspiration for for various fictional serial killers in books and films. Gein's crime was discovered in 1957 when police investigated the disappearance of a hardware store owner, Bernice Warden. During a search of Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging in Gein's shed, dressed out like a deer. Dressed, like skinned. Further investigation revealed a house of horrors as Gein was a grave robber who exhumed corpses from local cemeteries. He admitted to creating a variety of items from human body parts, including clothing, furniture, and masks. Gein's gruesome artifacts shocked the public so much and fueled sensationalized media coverage, and Gein was suspected in the disappearances of two other individuals, but only two deaths were definitely linked to him, Bernice Warden, and his own brother, Henry Gein. Ed Gein was declared mentally unfit for trial and spent the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his confinement included time in the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane in Wapone, Wisconsin, later in a mental health institution. He was kind of inspired for that chainsaw massacre thing as well. Number 6, Clementine Barnabet. Clementine Barnabet was an American woman who gained notoriety in the early 20s century for alleged involvement in a series of death in Louisiana. Barnabet claimed to be a member of a religious cult led by her father, Raymond Barnabet, and she asserted that the cult believed in cleansing the world by killing those that seemed sinful. Between 1911 and 1912, a series of brutal axe deaths occurred in Texas and Louisiana, and Barnabet confessed to being involved in some of these killings. In 1912, Clementine was arrested along with her father, two brothers, and the connections of these deaths. She confessed to her involvement in the crimes, claiming that she and her family were carrying out God's works, killing sinners. It was a job. Barnabet confession came under scrutiny as some believed it might have been coerced or influenced by her father, but uh, there were also doubts about the accuracy of her statements. And uh, regarding the number of victims and her role in the killings, Clementine Barnabet then went to trial for her alleged um, 
involvement in the crime. In 1913, she was found guilty and sentenced to prison, and her father and brothers were also convicted, but more of a lengthy sentence. Clementine Barnabet spent the rest of her life in prison and was never released, thankfully. And the circumstance surrounding the crime remains a controversial and still unsolved or unresolved. Number five, Jeffrey Epstein. I know a lot of folks know this man is a greedy, nasty, rich jerk who lived in a vile organization, allowing other rich, nasty folk to take advantage of the young and vulnerable. But as the ringleader of a trafficking and harming of young women everywhere, apparently in 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges in Florida for soliciting and procuring a person under 18 for adult work, meaning under 18, young adolescents, like the age of 12 or 14. He then reached a plea deal that allowed him to avoid federal charges and served only 13 months in jail. This lenient deal orchestrated by the then US attorney Alexander Acosta later then became a subject of public scrutiny. Which as it should, considering why is the US so lenient on crimes on young people? Like people that the law should protect. And then finally, 10 years later after who knows how much more damage and crime he's committed, in July 2019, federal prosecutors in New York arrested Epstein on trafficking charges. They accused him of exploiting and abusing dozens of underage girls and the arrest following the unsealing of a new indictment but by then 2020, somehow he died in his cell. Some say he took his own life and others, well, when it comes to controversy, that they didn't want him to talk. After all, the nature of his relationships and the extent of his activities fueled public outrage. He wasn't alone in this after all, he needed someone else to lure these young underage individuals. So Ghislaine Maxwell, you know her, was also charged and arrested. Investigations into Epstein's activities and the circumstances surrounding the 2008 plea deal continued. Legal actions against his estate and those connected to him remain ongoing, reflecting the broader effort to seek justice for their victims. Number 4. Joseph James Delangelo Joseph James Delangelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, is an American serial killer and caused this YouTube because I gotta be very discreet physically violated people, if you know what I mean, who terrorized, Cal uh, who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. D'Angelo's crime was initially attributed to several monk years, including East Area Harmer and Original Night Stalker, unlike Richard Ramirez, another serial killer and vile man. His crime initially began in the Sacramento area before spreading out to other parts of the state. D'Angelo's modus operandi included breaking into homes, often targeting couples, because he was just jealous. He would tie up and harm the victims, committing non-consensual harm and then theft. In later crimes, he escalated to killings, earning him the nickname the Golden State Killer. The, the case remained unsolved for decades, but advancement in DNA technology played a crucial role in solving it. In 2018, investigators used a public ge genealogy website to identify distant relatives of the suspect and eventually led them to Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was arrested on April 24, 2018 at his home in Citrus Heights, California, and he was identified through DNA evidence and genealogical research. At the time of his arrest, D'Angelo was also, get this, a former police officer, which added to an extra layer of shock to the case. In August 2020, D'Angelo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the sentence marking the conclusion of one of the most notorious unsolved criminal cases in US history. Number three, Nathan Bedford Forrest. What a name. There's so many interesting names on this list. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a prominent Confederate general during the American Civil War. Unsurprisingly, given his culpability in the Ford Pillow Massacre in April 1864 and the formation of the Triple Ks, Forrest and his image may have come under attack by many sectors, especially from African Americans. The Triple Ks embarked upon a campaign of intimidation and violence against Southern blacks and Republicans until Forrest ordered the organization to disbanded in 1869. Nevertheless, the local chapters of the Triple Ks continued to be active and Forrest was ordered to appear before congressional hearing in 1871 and his sometimes contradictory testimony he denied he ever had membership in this organization yeah you're He's the one who had the receipt. A combination of age, exhaustion, and conversation to Christianity may have caused the Forrest's fiery temper and racial attitudes to his moderate and later years. Number two, Samuel Little. Apparently noted the most discreet but also most vile crime committing killers. The reason why he was able to get away with over killing 93 women was because of the time or the height of these deaths. Majority, if not all of these women were women of color who worked as adult workers. And because in the 70s, law enforcement didn't prioritize people of color or the occupation of working as an adult worker, any case of missing persons from both of these factions as a cohesive was met with dismissal. So Samuel, who had a blood thirst for control and death, committed to these crimes only to these main demographics and even admitted that once he was caught at a homeless shelter in Kentucky. Originally the arrest was over narcotics, but while they tested DNA, they found the link to his crimes that were left as cold cases. And he actually memorized all of the victims that he had killed. That's crazy. Number one, Raymond Volden Lehrer and John Heller. These men are hella messed up and I'm not surprised, but it's also known that, um, yeah, that's pretty much why these guys are on this list. Specifically Raymond, he was a doctor who, re who ran a research study to learn about the effects of syphilis on 400 African American men. Also supposedly also 600 African men around that range. The study began in 1932 and in the 1940s the cure of syphilis was discovered in penicillin. As a result, during the experimentation, the doctors didn't tell the patients they had syphilis and didn't even give them a cure. Even some of the subjects who have heard about penicillin, so the doctors gave them sugar pills and said that they were cured when they weren't. 
They even prevented 50s era public health campaigns to cure syphilis from operating in their area, and they told patients that the painful spinal taps and other procedures were free treatments. They did not allow patients to see any other doctors just in case those other doctors would cure them and mess up their so called research. Many of the patients were drafted for World War II, and the military wanted to cure their syphilis and recruit them, which the researchers fought as best as they were able to, and the study finally ended in 1972. By that time, 128 of the men have died from syphilis, and the rest have been treated by military while they were drafted. Many of the children were born with syphilis related birth defects, and more than that, born dead. The last victim of this gross and horrible experiment, also known as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, was Ernest Hendon, who died on the 16th of January 2004. According to Fred Gray, a lawyer who represented victims of the study of the federal lawsuit, eventually in the courts as well as the study of the law of the case brought to wild attention of the three that were unethical of the study. Evidently, the rights of the research subjects were violated. The Tuskegee study raised a lot of host of ethical issues such as informed consent, racism, patronism, unfair subject selection in research, maleficence, truth telling, and and justice, among others. The gross part that even though the research helped reduce syphilis, John got an award for it despite the traumatizing things that he had done to the patients for life. Number 10, Barbara Opal. Barbara Opal needed money, and she was living with Jerry Duane Heyman, age 64, and his mother, 89. Including living with her 13-year-old daughter, she thought, hey, you know what? I know these old people we're living with has money, so I'm going to hire my daughter and her friends, or five teenagers, and tell them to steal $40,000 from Jerry and his mother. So she hired her 13-year-old daughter, paid $220 to a 14-year-old named Kyle, and his 13-year-old cousin, $100, and a 17-year-old Jeffrey Goat to get a, to have a getaway car. The five teens ambushed Hyman and attacked him with knives and baseball bats. Hyman's body was found eight days later in a shallow grave roughly 10 miles from the house, and Barbara's other children aged 7 and 11 were instructed to mop up the blood. During the trial, Opal denied that she wanted him dead. In fact, she would say that she was telling her friends as a joke, I just wish he was dead. Not that he actually was dead. After all, language is important. But what was also important is the fact that she was found guilty and barely skimmed the death penalty, as the jury could not find a unanimous decision. Following her conviction, she was banned to contact her children or be in the same prison with them, as her daughter Heather pleaded guilty of the first degree at the age of 14. She received life in prison with a non-parole of 22 years, making her only eligible as of now, 2023, as she is now 36 years old. Opal is currently incarcerated at the Washington Correction Center for Women, and her case has been featured in shows with the episodes titled Mommy's Little Killers. Number 9, Buffalo Crime Family. The Italian-American organized crime syndicate have been also called as the Buffalo Mafia, located in Buffalo, New York. Like all other organized crime families, they have engaged in various criminal activities over the years, including extortion, racketeering, illegal gambling, loan sharking, and trafficking. They were also established in the 1930s, and over the years, law enforcement's efforts include successful prosecutions and increased scrutiny have weakened the Buffalo crime family. Additionally, internal conflicts and changing criminal landscapes have impacted its influence. The activities of the Buffalo crime family have a significant impact on the city of Buffalo itself and its surrounding region, and they have been involved in various criminals' enterprises and have influenced the local economy and social dynamics. Last update of this family was of January 2022, as their power and influence has greatly diminished compared to its formative years. It's believed that the the family's activities have become more low profile and focused on traditional organized crime enterprises. Number 8, Turpin. The Turpin case refers to a severe and widely publicized case of harm and mistreatments and captivity involving the Turpin family. The case came into light of January 2018 when David and Louise Turpin were arrested for holding their 13 children captive in their home in Paris, California to USA. Turpin children ranged in age from 2 to 29 years old at the time of the discovery and were found malnourished, living in vulgar conditions, and subjected to severe physical and emotional harm, often kept in locked rooms with limited access to food and basic necessities. They were allowed to shower only once a year and were not permitted to engage in normal childhood activities, and the case came into light when one of the Turpin daughters, 17 year old at the time, managed to escape through a window and contact the police. She used a deactivated cell phone found in the house to make an emergency call. David and Louise Turpin were arrested on January 14, 2018, and were initially charged with multiple counts of torment, false imprisonment, and more. They pleaded guilty to 14 charges. The Turpin case received significant media coverage and sparked a national and international discussion on harm, neglect, and the role of child protective services. But unfortunately, the same child services that were meant to protect the children of this family also resulted in them being in a foster care system that also failed them and caused more harm. In a general nutshell, a complete and utter disaster. Number 7, Sante and Kenneth Kimes. Sante and Kenneth Kimes were a mother and daughter duo involved in a series of notorious criminal activities, including fraud, identity theft, and mur uh, I can't say murder. Sante and Kenneth Kimes were a mother and son duo involved in a series of notorious criminal activities, including fraud, identity theft, 
stuff and killings. Sandy Kimes were born in 1934 and her son was born in 1974. They were involved in various fraudulent schemes including embezzlement, insurance fraud, and theft. They were used multiple aliases and false identities to carry out their schemes. And finally, after a fatal crime committed by the two of the life of David Kasdan. Kasdan was a wealthy New York businessman who they had befriended and only had the intention of killing him to somehow attempt to steal his fortune. The investigation into the crime of David revealed a history of criminal activities by the by the Kemzies, and law enforcement agencies in several states had been investigating them for a several range of offenses. In addition of the crime of David, the Kemzies were linked to other criminal activities including disappearance and presumed killings of other individuals who had been associated with them. In 2000, Sante and Kenneth Kames were both convicted of multiple charges, including death, conspiracy, and fraud. They were both sentenced in life imprisonment and without the possibility of parole. Number 6, The Bogles. In the case of The Bogles, that had ended after having 60 members of the family in jail or in prison. The statistics of this family is actually pretty extraordinary and in the book I mentioned in the opening, In My Father's House by Fox Butterfield, discovered in his research of this family and how many members there were that were convicted at one point in their life. Looking at family values and behavior in the cases of the Bogles, they were actually very conscious of intimidating the behavior of their father and their aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers, an opinion that been fundamental to our understanding of human nature since when it comes to the psychologist Harry Harlow, Harlow demonstrated that a strong emotional bond with one's parents and a secure attachment can make all the difference in a child's emotional and social development. In this family, crimes include robbing, fraud, drug possession, child endangerment, death, drunk driving, kidnapping, physically harming somebody, strangulation, and so much more. But one member of the family decided to break the cycle, Ashley Bodle, as the first college graduate of her family in 150 years. And I wish Ashley a heartfelt good luck in her endeavors. Number five, Gertrude Benazwiski. Gertrude was an American woman who gained infamy for her involvement in the torment and death of Sylvia Likens, a 16 year old girl in 1965. The case is often referred to as one of the most gruesome and shocking crimes in American history. Gertrude was a mother of seven children. Sylvia Likens and her sister, Jenny Likens, were left in the care of the family by their parents who were traveling with a carnival. Gertrude was paid by the girl's parents to take care of them, and over a course of several months, Sylvia was subjected to extreme physical and emotional harm at the hands of Gertrude, her children, and several neighborhood youths. Apparently, one of Gertrude's children was very jealous of Sylvia. The abuse included beatings, burnings, and other forms of torture. And in October 1965, Sylvia succumbed to her injuries and died as a result of the prolonged harm. Sylvia's death was eventually discovered by authorities and charged in connection of Sylvia's murder. So the entire neighborhood was basically in on it. She was initially sentenced to death, but her sentence was later commuted to a life imprisonment and she's paroled in 1985, but she died of lung cancer in 1990. Number four, Rivera. Although the Rivera family's photos on social media suggest a very close group with a loving get-togethers, community service, and family outings, have an unfortunate strain of pain and remorse. Angel Rivera and his son Christopher Otero Rivera Montalvo husband had been arrested for killing of Nicole Montalvo. Wanda Rivera, the family matriarch, is accused of tampering with evidence and lying to investigators. And Nicholas Rivera, the family's youngest son, is considered a person of interest in Montalvo's killings. Montalvo's remains were actually found in the Rivera's property in St. Cloud and a vacant lot on Henry J Avenue owned by Nicholas Rivera, who also faces eight unrelated counts of possessing CP. The Florida County Sheriff Russ Gibson called it probably the most gruesome crime scene he has ever seen in 32 years of law enforcement. Little information has been made public about the investigation and according to the judge, leading the trial has said if the crime doesn't deserve a life sentence then what does? Both Christopher and Angel were sentenced to life prison for second degree. Additionally, they both received another 15 years for dismembering a human body and another 5 for tampering with the evidence. Number 3, Daybell. Lori Vallow Daybell is an American woman who gained national and international attention due to her involvement in a complex and tragic case involving the disappearance and death of her children. Lori Vallow has been married multiple times and her most notable marriage was to Charles Vallow who died in July 2019 and then Chad Daybell, an author of an apocalyptic themed books where she married shortly after the death of Charles. Lori Vallow's children, Tylee Ryan, age 17, and Joshua J.J. Vallow, age 7 years old, were last seen in September 2019. Their disappearance raised concerns and it was later revealed that Lori and her new husband, Chad, were uncooperative in providing information about their whereabouts. Lori and Chad faced increasing scrutiny for the law enforcement and the public. They were eventually located in Hawaii and were served with court orders to produce the children. Lori was arrested in Hawaii and extradited to Idaho, and she faced multiple charges, including abandonment and contempt of court. The remains of Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow were discovered on Chad Daybell's property in Salem, Idaho. Autopsy later confirmed their identity. Following the discovery of the bodies, both Lori and Chad faced additional charges, including conspiracy to commit death. Their cases gained widespread media attention. 
Number two, Daniel and Jessica Groves. Noted in local news in Ohio, the parents of a baby boy was found dead in a well and have been guilty on multiple charges. The jury convicted Jessica Groves on all 11 accounts, including death, and Daniel Groves on all but one charge, aggravated death. The couple was convicted on what would have been their baby Dylan's Groves' first birthday. Following their conviction, Jessica was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus an additional 32 years, and Daniel was sentenced to 47. The couple stood trial for their death of their two month year old son. They were arrested on June 2019 after Dylan's decomposed body was found at the bottom of a 30 foot well near their home. Home. According to the county coroner's office, the two-month-year-old's body was wrapped in plastic bags and duct tape and then placed in milk crates cured by chains, padlocks, and zip ties. Dylan's cause of death was determined as homicidal violence, and the child had survived multiple bone fractures and broken ribs, as well as methamphetamine and amphetamine was found in his system. The duo Daniel and Jessica were harmful and had purposeful damages, and Dylan had initially placed in the foster care after he was born with drugs in his system, but the failure of the foster system again allowed them to have access to their child again. That the case of Dylan had brought national attention to Ohio's opioid epidemic and the state family's reunification process. Even the director of the county's child services stepped down after the agent's mishandling of Dylan's case that resulted in his death. Number one, Sackler. Speaking of opioid epidemic crisis, want to know who was responsible in a wider scale of this crisis? Yes, I know, maybe you have heard of them, considering they own a large pharma company that ended up going on bankrupt. But hey, don't worry, these rich folks are okay as they later founded another company called Mundi Pharma, which is a British multinational research-based company that located in the UK. Canada, Germany, and Singapore. Not a lot of people know about them, so it's worth noting who's responsible for the opioid crisis due to the irresponsibilities of this family. Geographically, specifically, the opioid crisis in the United States and Canada. And also it's worth noting that they were called the most evil family in America, as well as the worst dealers in history multiple times. And considering the fact that they had over 1,600 cases against them as they persuaded the American medical market that strong opioids should be distributed. After all, in accordance to an article in 2022 by the Harvard School of Public Health without urgent intervention of over 1.2 million people in the US and Canada will die from an opioid overdose by the end of the decade. But this family wanted to sell it anyway, because they don't care. And despite the bankruptcy they endured, the family still has billions of dollars. Forbes estimate that the family comprises of 40 members still worth about $10.8 billion. So don't worry, these rich people are fine. Yeah.